And it was so nice to see how it almost changed his life. Like to go from this guy that was making 40 grand a year and, and probably was there for four years stuck in a rut to then opening up a door for him to go in into a contract role and seeing that he could work into lots of different environments and be very versatile, but that he had such a specific skill set that he didn't even know that, ex that people wanted. All right, Doug, thank you so much for joining us today, brother. Appreciate thank, it. Thank you for having me. Oh. I love what you've done with the place. Thank you, man. Appreciate awesome. it. Yeah, we're, we're getting settled in here, but uh, yeah, we're liking how it's coming along. Good. So if it's okay, I uh, I brought you a little gift. Oh, really? Yeah. Dude, you so, don't have to do that. Uh, obviously, you can open it now. We have, uh, we've oh, been friends now on, for man. a few years, but I guess we've become pretty close over the last few months. Yeah, yeah, we go way back. And uh, yeah, I hope you like it. And I hope it goes well in here. I kind of thought it would be a, a cool thing to have. Dude, this, is, this is fucking awesome, man. Thank you. Wow. As, as an Englishman, this is, uh, this is how we roll. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you, brother. No, my thank pleasure, you so man. much. As you know, we have a bunch of Kobe stuff I know. here. So I know. I knew that you... I, actually, I don't know if that shows up on the No, on it the doesn't. Video, it so, doesn't. This uh, will be a prominent... Yeah. you know place on the set thank You're you welcome brother. wow really really cool <laughs> my pleasure thank you so much man really thoughtful dude yeah <clears throat> you brits you brits that's yeah that's how we roll man that's how Goodness. we roll so uh yeah man you and i go way back i mean like the, the first time we met you handed me a metal business card and that's how the whole <laughs> story started right you know what? so like, what's, yeah. the, what's the story behind the metal business card like so, just just really quickly for our yeah. listeners that don't so, know you and I met. I was on a panel at Refresh Miami. Yep. Uh, my God, what was that? Two thousand six years ago. So six years ago. Two thousand thirteen, fourteen. Thirteen, fourteen ish, yeah. right? Uh, I get off stage. Normally, when you get off stage at a panel or you're talking, you know, people line up to ask you questions. So I'm dealing with the crowd a little bit, and then all of a sudden, you hand, you said, "Hey, you know, I'm Doug. Nice to meet you. I do recruiting." And you handed me a, a metal business card, like yep. a, it literally like weighed like a pound, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then I believe you asked for it back. Did you not? No, <laughs> I definitely didn't ask for it back. You did get it back though. I think later I think on. you gave it back. I think to I gave you, it yeah. back to you because it was pretty substantial. But what was the story? Like, why'd you get a metal business card? So uh, I worked for a company in uh, the UK called the Tin, mm. and they were a digital media company. Mm -hmm. And they gave me a metal business card, and I thought it was fantastic. That's a great it was idea. A, the first time I ever saw it. In the UK, business cards aren't a big thing, right. but in the US, they're huge, right? right. So when I moved over here, I decided I'd just get 100 metal business cards mm -hmm. made and the normal ones, and then I would use them as and when needed. Yeah, so yeah. if I was sat at a bar talking to someone, if I met a CTO of a company, yeah. if I met someone at a panel discussion, I'd give them a metal business card. So yeah. it just, they went down a treat and they went, and you imagine 100 of them went pretty quickly. Um, and then I had another 100 made and now I even give them to my guys to hand out as well. Well, so. actually now I'm remembering the story a little bit better. You handed me a metal business card. We talked for a little bit. And then you emailed me the next day. Yes. You're like, hey, I'm Doug. I'm the guy that handed you the metal <laughs> business card. And of course, like, you know, you, the next <laughs> you day you get it. all these emails. You don't remember all these people. But I definitely remember the dude that handed me the metal business card. Yeah, yeah. And he was a tall six or four English guy. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> which, which made the memory even easier to remember. So. <laughs> for sure. For sure. But you don't get that context over email. So that that's super helpful. Yeah. So, yeah, man. So really quick, uh, would love to hear about your background. And you're in recruiting. You own a recruiting business, Benjamin Douglas, yeah. right? Uh, so I'd like to hear a little bit of your background. What brought you to the States and what made you get into recruiting in yeah. general? So um, I guess I fell into recruitment in 2004, like most people do. Mm. Uh, no one goes to university and says, right. I want to be a recruitment consultant. Right. Like it just doesn't happen. Yep. So um, I had been in sales for, for a while. Recruitment seemed like the next logical step. I worked for a fantastic company in London called GCS for about 10 years on and off. And uh, realized that it was a career that I could grow into and, and do well in. Mm -hmm. Um, I lived in Dubai in the Middle East for a little bit, um, did some recruitment over there in 2008 and 2009 when the world was falling apart. So not the best of times to, to be recruiting. Um, and then I moved back to, to London and, and continued my, my kind of career with GCS. Mm. Um, about 10 years ago, I decided to go on a round the world trip. I was 30 years of age. I thought if I don't go now, I might never get a chance to do it. So I went to uh, Thailand, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Peru, Brazil, Miami, Vancouver, and then back to London. Three months on my own, reinvented myself, had friends in quite a few of those locations. Um, and before I left, someone told me about The Secret. 
and uh, I watched the documentary. So I didn't read the book, but I thought I watched the documentary and I got to the end of it. It's all about positive, throwing positive vibes out into the, into right. the universe and getting good things come back on you, right. which I love. So I bounced around the world with a massive smile on my face and attracted nothing but friends and memories and ultimately came home with a wife. Mm. So I met a kid in Fiji who introduced me to, to Stephanie on Facebook. I uh, came to Miami, we went out for one night uh, and sparks flew, You just when you know, you know, right? right. Uh, six months later, she took me to Lake Como. I proposed to her at the side of the lake and three months later, we got married here in Miami and that was 10 years ago. Wow. So that's the short version, Crazy. and obviously I've, I've told you the long version over the years. Yep. But so yeah, so that's my my kind of life story with regards to recruitment. Um, when I moved to the US, I was speaking to the, the likes of K Force and Robert Half and all of the big recruitment agencies, and uh, I think the standard in in America is to offer ten days vacation. And I was used to thirty five in in London, and I like traveling. I like spending time with my family. So I said, maybe it's about time I start up on my own. So I started up a franchise, a company called Glorec. Based out in South Africa, they basically give you a full recruitment back office package, and then you just go out there and do the business, and then they take a, a small percentage from the top. Did that for a few years. It was fantastic. Um, started working with a company here in Miami and decided to do a joint venture with them. Um, that's how Benjamin Douglas came about. And we're now in our sixth year, which is insane. Um, we are predominantly a technology staffing agency. Right, you um, have a lot of startups and te tech startups, companies. Startups, tech companies. Programmers SMEs, and things like that. Yep, anything, cybersecurity, developers, mm -hmm. designers, project managers, business analysts, anything that covers that tech sort yep. of spectrum. We realized very quickly if you have a technology product service app, you need to sell it. So we started placing enterprise sales, software sure. sales, account yeah. managers. Yeah, you did. we worked together in the past. You VP of sales. VP of sales, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. Shout out to Venki. Yeah, <laughs> good old Venki. <laughs> yep. um, so yeah, so so we are, like I say, we're in our sixth year. We're yep. a small boutique. We're about seven people. Um, but we actually give a shit. Mm -hmm. Like compared to some of these other big organizations, we when we get a job, when we get a client, we put our arms around them and we really work hard to make sure we can find them the talent they need. So Yeah, definitely. And I can tell you're passionate about the space. Like you really like your job. Like, can you tell a little bit about why you're passionate about recruiting? Because it sounds from the outside, you're like, hey, I'm a recruiter. But there's much more to that. You're affecting people's lives, right, on a daily yeah. basis. So why are, you passing, why are you personally passionate about it? So I guess the one thing that I realized very quickly is that you have to be a good people person. For sure. Right? Because yeah. we're working with one of the toughest products in the world, which mm -hmm. is unre unre unreliable people. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to be able to match a company and a candidate and mm -hmm. the culture and the skill set and whatever else. So I think that's something that I've been good at. Mm. And that's why I'm passionate. Um, a story that I tell people is, is in, in London, I was working with a, a law firm. They were looking for a, a skill set called Mondosoft's Mondo Search. It's almost like a gold dust. In, it's impossible to find. Mm -hmm. And I found this, uh, this gentleman who was working for Harrods, the, the uh, department store. He'd been there for four years and was making around 40,000 pounds a year. Mm -hmm. This company were offering 400 pounds a, a day to come in as a contractor and, and work on this Mondo, Mondo Soft Mondo Search platform. So I took him out and he ended up interviewing. He got the job. He was there for two years. He was making, he went from making 40,000 to like 120,000. Him and his wife fell in love with each other again. Mm. He had another baby. They brought a new house. I used to catch up with him every three to six months. And it was so nice to see how it almost changed his life. Yeah. Like to go from this guy that was making 40 grand a year and, and probably was there for four years stuck in a rut to then opening up a door for him to go in into a contract role yep. and seeing that he could work into lots of different environments and be very versatile, but that he had such a specific skill set that he didn't even know that, ex that people wanted. So I think that's something that I, I feel is I'm passionate about is just being able to change people's lives, find people a job that they love. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it has such a compounding effect when you work for a place and you're happy there as a compounding effect on every aspect of your life, right? Your, your marriage, your relationship with your kids, uh, you know, just your day-to-day -day sense of well-being. I yeah. mean, people are miserable when they're working somewhere they hate, right? And just everything changes when you can align their passions or their potential in a new gig, right? So you can do that every day with recruiting. They say you spend more time at work <clears throat> than you do with your family. Yep. So if you can't get on with the people that you work with and you don't enjoy what you do, then you're going to be miserable and then you're going to take that home with you. Yeah, yeah, so. definitely. No, I can totally relate to that. Um, so yeah, so I, I'd like to, 
you know, dive deep into like a lot of tips that people that are listening can learn from you because you've seen a lot of things in your years in this business, right? Yeah. You've seen a lot of like great things that people have done. You've seen a lot of mistakes people make when recruiting and hiring when people are looking for a job. One of the things I want to start off with is how important is online presence? Like these days, like is the, one of the first things people do, they Google somebody's name, like like how important is that and what tips can you give people regarding online presence? It's massively important. Yeah. So um, there are obviously three profiles that you have, mm -hmm. right? There's your online profile, which is typically your LinkedIn profile, could be your social media profile as well, because people now look at that. Yep. Um, then you have your resume, which is your on paper profile, and then you have your in-person profile. Yep. So all three of those, there needs to be continuity between them. You need mm -hmm. to make sure that they all add up because if one of them's different to another, then it's going right. to like cause a red flag. And and pe <laughs> just so people aren't naive, people, every single person that's hiring anybody will Google your name. Like of that's course. like the first thing they're going to do, right? So 100%. you need to be aware of what those results are and what image you're sending out to the world. Yeah, and especially if you're if you have a Facebook profile that you're putting all of your personal stuff on right. there, if they can see that, then it may make. Sure. cloud their judgment on how they make a decision of course of course so keeping your personal life and, and your kind of professional life separate right. is very key right and a lot of these <clears> decisions <throat> get made sometimes somebody that's hiring they're looking at five different resumes they see one person holding a beer people make judgments you know what i mean and it mentally checks them out even and though we all that's drink, not, right? yeah exactly even though that's not justified at all we need to be aware of busy people that are looking at our online profiles and what they could you know you know you know, digest online and what yep. they could do with that information. Of course. Right. And that's why we always say to people, just make sure that your LinkedIn profile is professional, that your picture is professional. You don't want to take one of your pictures from, from Facebook and right. put that on your LinkedIn. Would you say LinkedIn's the most important? Nowadays, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think since Microsoft acquired them, mm -hmm. they've put money into it. Um, it's a fantastic platform. There are hundreds of millions of people on LinkedIn. It's right. the place to find like most candidates. Right. And if you open up a profile and there's not a picture on there, most people will just move on. Right, exactly. It's like, I don't even know who I'm talking yeah, to. Yeah. I don't know who I'm working with. You haven't had the time to put a, a LinkedIn profile picture on them. Right. May, maybe you're not going to have the time to come in and do a good job for us. Right, right. And LinkedIn is a, mm. is a, is a platform that, basically anybody could view your profile with Facebook. You need a request of, you know, to be a friend with yeah. Twitter. Sometimes you could protect the accounts. Instagram's the same way. You could have a private account, but LinkedIn, if somebody has a LinkedIn account, they could view your profile. So yeah, makes sense. Um, so quick tip, make sure your online presence is cleaned up, right? Just to do a quick audit on yourself, Google your name, see what comes up and yeah. you know, tailor it up. Um, let's get into some top hiring mistakes that you've seen over the years. Okay. I think that's super important. Uh, I've, I've looked and like, I, I think actually let's, let's turn it back before we get into top hiring mistakes and top tips. Why even hire you? Why a recruiter? Why like, I think a why lot, take on a recruiter? exactly. Right. Like for example, me, <laughs> right? Like when I started my business, I, I was naive to recruitment because I got to pay you a fee, of right? Course. Like anytime you find a candidate for me, I got to pay you money. Yep. Um, and I think all, a lot of CEOs and entrepreneurs will be like, you know, a recruiter doesn't know who's the best fit for me. I know who's the best fit. I want to do my own recruiting. I want to do my own searching. I want to do my own hiring. Of course. There are aspects of that, of course, that you could self-maintain. Yep. But later on, as I started, you know, getting on in the years with my business, I brought you in and I could immediately see the value of why a recruiter is important. Tell some of the people that are listening, if they're on the fence of never hired a recruiter before, why hiring a recruiter is a good idea. Of course. So as a business owner, or a manager, yep. you need to be doing your thing, right? Whether that's growing a team, whether that's running a business, whether that's looking after the finance, the operations, whatever that is, you need to have that time to do that. By hiring a recruiter, we take away that time from you, right? We take away all of the time that it takes to go through resumes, to advertise a job, to speak to candidates, to qualify them properly. If you work with a decent recruiter, they will come and spend time with you and understand your culture. They'll, they'll see your office. They'll get to meet some of your team. They'll understand exactly what it is you're looking for so that when they're speaking to candidates, they can qualify them correctly to make sure that the ones you're seeing aren't just random spray and pray, mm. right? So I think the value for money is we take all of that time away from you. We spend time with these candidates, whether it be over the phone, whether it be meeting them in person. We background check them. We reference them. We do all of the 
the medial stuff that you would have to have done and then really all you have to do is interview them so you're still getting the time to spend time to see if they're a good culture fit right right we don't take that away from you we can't choose if they're going to be if they're going to be a right fit for you as a manager you have to have that chemistry with them right if you don't have that chemistry then they're probably not going to be right for your organization so yep. we can't tell what that's going to be like until they come into a room with you but we can at least try and weed out all of the people that aren't right to make sure that you have three to five solid people that are going to be a good fit that makes sense so yeah. it's really about buying back your time yeah but i also think that the greatest thing about what we offer and, and, and in industry standard across the board is that if you pay us a fee right you have three months to try that person out and also for that candidate the candidate might come on board and realize that this is not right for them right. or they've made the wrong decision or they're doing a long commute but you have three months which is pretty it's a decent uh, amount of time it's a long By that time, time they're onboarded and they understand kind of the are they going to fit in with the team right. are they good with the culture are they someone that we feel is going to be here long term right if it doesn't work out then you don't have to pay us anything else we go and find you a free replacement right so i think so that's zero dollars out of pocket yeah that's your fallback yep. right so we and we with clients that have startups that don't want to pay out massive fees we can be flexible but mm. we can also extend that mm -hmm. so we might say look we, instead of doing it for three months why don't we put it for six mm. so now you've got half a year to really test out this candidate and if at that point they're doing a great job then that fee was worth it right if they're not then you come back to us and we go and find you someone else that's awesome that's awesome yeah so it really is when you think about it when working with a company like benjamin douglas is not really a lot of risk right because you're getting all that time back that you would spend again yeah. placing the, the job ads and searching for candidates interviewing the wrong candidates is a huge time waster i learned that firsthand right you'd get this influx of applications for a job and you'd be like why am i even spending an hour you know obviously no offense but you know why am i spending an hour with this person that's definitely not qualified for the gig yeah you know because it's really hard for you just based on a resume or based on something to really weed things out. So that's, again, you're a great filter for that. We are. And when and your time is valuable. For right? sure. When you're starting a business, you need to have all the time you can. Just, there's not enough hours in the day typically as an entrepreneur or a business owner. So to be able to take, we go through those resumes. We weed through all of that. We right. speak to all the candidates that are right or wrong. And we make sure that we get down to a, three like i say typically it's three to five mm -hmm. is enough and even if after that first round they're not right then we would come back again and we would go find another three to five we think that's great that's great so i think that's a great segue into the top hiring mistakes that people make um you know when they're looking at candidates what have you seen in the past like what are some like giving those hiring mistakes we can identify and give tips on people what not to do in the hiring process of course yeah, yeah. so so many um and, and again over the years i've had so many i've got probably so many different examples that i can give you but for me one of the the biggest mistakes is the the process mm -hmm. okay um making sure that your internal process is tight uh, i'm getting sick of hearing people saying that there's no talent out there especially here in miami so there's no talent in miami we can't find good people there are. There are some fantastic people here, and I've proved that because we've placed a lot of candidates in the Miami and South Florida area, but it all depends on, on the, the, the client and their internal processes and if they're willing to pay. Okay, So, for example, um, we work with a company here that um, they're a startup, but they've been given some funding. They've got a lot of money. And they were looking for an Android developer. Mm -hmm. And you know, everyone in Miami wants a mobile developer. Sure, iOS, iOS Android, Android, Android yeah. you name it, right? So Huge we found demand. We found them a 26 year old kid who was making 145K. Mm -hmm. We put him forward, they interviewed him, they loved him, they said, this guy's great. They offered him 130. And we were like, he's on 145. But yeah, but we're a great company. We're an awesome company, we're a cool company to work for, we're gonna give him stocks and shares. And he's 26 years of age, he's on 145K and you're already giving him a 15K. Mm -hmm. So what happened is he ended up interviewing somewhere else. Sure. And they offered him 170. Sure. So what do you think he did? He grabbed it and, and disappeared. And then the client came back to us and said, oh, we can't find anyone. Mm. So if they had offered him 145K at the start, he would have taken the job. Yeah. But the fact that they lowballed him because they were a cool company and because they were a startup and they couldn't afford to pay for him, they missed out on him. Mm. So that's something that I get is, is very frustrating for us. For it's sure. frustrating for candidates. But also, if your internal processes are, we're going to interview someone, but we're going to try and lowball them at the start, it's never going to work. Another great takeaway from that is learn to become an iOS developer. Shit, 170K. Yeah. 26 <laughs> years of age? Amazing. Are you kidding me? Amazing. All right, so we covered the first two, long interview process, low-balling candidate. What's number three on your list? 
So um, number three on my list would be when interviewing candidates, the problem that a lot of people do, a lot of clients talk about themselves, talk about the business, yep. talk about the role, and never actually ask open questions. Mm. So an interview, an hour interview could pass really quickly. And basically, how are you going to get to know someone if all you're doing is talking about yourself? Yeah, so you it's make about a two-way conversation. You have to listen, right? So opening, asking open questions, like what is it that led you to be being in this role? Like talk to me about your experience. Like asking things that get them to talk. Talk to me about a time where you had a problem with something and how you overcame it. Right, listening to how they respond to those things is massively important. And a lot of people don't have that interview technique. So I think when you're hiring people, you need to be prepared, mm -hmm. right? Make sure that you have those questions. The, the candidate's gonna have lots of questions for you, but you need to make sure that they're a good culture fit. You need to make sure that they've got the skill set, but you also need to make sure that there's some chemistry there. Mm -hmm. And you can only do that if it is a two-way conversation. Don't just speak at them and talk about everything that you think is, is what they want to hear. You need to, because you're selling to them as much as they're selling to you. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So I think it's important for you to understand that the candidate is going to have the questions they want to ask you, but make sure that you ask them plenty of open questions so and listen to what their, their feedback is. So one of the things that I found worked for me when I was hiring at Live Ninja, when there was a candidate that I really wanted, you know, definitely employing this, this tip, you would need to make sure you're listening, but you really need to kind of put the questions back on them and say, listen, and this goes back to making sure you're serving them like this role that they're about to take on. How is this role going to serve them in their career? Right. Yep. You need to think from their perspective that this is, you know, could be long-term, but it could be also a couple of years. You need to be okay with that. Right. So what I would, would lean in with is like, all right, look, you know, <laughs> let me ask you, what are you looking to gain out of this role? Yeah. How could this company serve you? How could this company help you? Where do you want to be? Let's say, and, and I would say, look, you're super talented. I am self-aware that you're probably going to leave here in a few years to another gig. Which is you, fantastic. Yeah. That you even have that self-awareness because not many people do. Right. You need, but like when you're interviewing rock star candidates, you need to know that. Like you're not going to have this person forever, yeah. right? In most instances, a lot of times the best candidates are also self-starters. So they'll be starting their own businesses, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I would say. I would say, look, I, I know that you're going to be moving on in a few years, just as the normal nature of any job, yeah. or you'll start your own business. So with that being said, when it's time to move on to your next gig, where do you want to be? And what I'll do is I'll align this role to help you get there. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that mm. usually served me pretty well when I was recruiting. Yeah. So that just goes in line with what you were talking about, no, talking, not listening. 100%. Yeah. Yep. All right. So moving on, we uh, unrealistic expectations, right? Yeah. yeah. So trying to find a purple squirrel, uh -huh. right? And, and look... I get it that you want the candidate the to have everything. Scrolls, yeah. yeah, that's that's the way. That's the, <laughs> that's the unicorn that they talk right, about. Right, right. I get it that you want a candidate to have everything. Right. They want an right. iOS developer that could also design UI, that could also market on social media. Yeah, that went to Stanford. <laughs> right, exactly. That's got one blue eye, one green right. eye. That's bilingual. Yeah, that's going to fit in with your culture. Exactly. And they will all do it for 50 grand. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Go, Doug, find that person. No, it doesn't happen. <laughs> so that's what unrealistic expectations. Sure. That's what I'm talking about, yeah. right? So there has to be some give and take. Mm. What I typically say is, is a, if you've got, 10 things that you want someone to have if that candidate's got seven to eight of them and there's a few things that they can either be coached on they can learn things that you they can come in and learn the culture of your business or whatever that is i think if they have 70 to 80 percent of it they're that's probably going to be a pretty decent candidate that's pretty damn good 50 to 60 percent and it's only half then maybe not so right but i think if you're asking for everything it's impossible and it makes our job as recruiters so much harder so that's why when we sit down with clients we try and drill down on what's massively important to you mm -hmm. and what could be a desirable skill or what could you go without mm. like if i found someone that had everything you want but they wanted to work from home for a day a week would you be open to that yes we would perfect because sometimes that can help so there has to be a little bit of give and take but i think also that salary piece is something that it comes back to right I, have you got the money for this person? Are you willing to pay them for that? And do you know what the market rates are? Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, this candidate is is sought after. Everyone wants him or her, and they're currently making X, Y, Z in the market. That's what you need to be willing to pay. And as startups and as entrepreneurs, sometimes they don't have that budget. So that's important to understand. And as consultants, that's what we're here for. We're here to educate you and let you know what the market is at the moment. Currently, these 
Android developers who are 26 years of age are making X, Y, Z, 150K, 170K. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And to that point, you know, you just brought up a, a really good point in that, you know, if a if your client, which is the company that's hiring, finds 70 to 80%, that's pretty damn good on what they're looking for in their job spec, right? Yep. Um, would you say, and now this is advice to the, to the people listening that are looking for great candidates, would you say it's wise then and it's common practice and it also is a good practice to like set the bar high as far as like what you write on your spec? Like I want all these things, but I know I'm only gonna get 70 to 80 or do you wanna like tailor the spec down to like realistic expectations? So sometimes you wanna shoot high and then get half of it. And I think this also is helpful for the people that are listening that are applying for jobs. There are many people that look for, for jobs and they'll see the requirements and they'll be like, well, I'm disqualified because there's one bullet point that they don't that, have. That they don't have. Would you still encourage those people to apply for the job because that's what people do? Right? Yes. Okay. So so the one thing that I've become very good at is mm -hmm. being able to match a job description with a resume. Now, they might not always have everything that the job description wants, but they have, like I say, 70 to 80%, maybe even up to 90%. But as a candidate, if you look at a job description and there's one line in there that says, I need someone with JavaScript experience, and you don't have JavaScript experience, but you t tick every other box. Right you should definitely apply for that job, mm. right? So, and then sometimes it's the soft skills. Sometimes it's the communication. Maybe right. it's the- um, Bilingual. Speaking, right. well, if you're speaking another Spanish, another, right. another language right, like right. Spanish, then right. the chances are you're probably not gonna get it. Right, so, right, right. But yeah, I mean, I think if, if you're looking at- Because here in Miami, I feel like everything's bilingual, right? Yeah. You know. Most people want yeah, a yeah. Spanish speaker, it doesn't but, matter. But sometimes I've had experience where uh, I've looked for bilingual for a marketing gig, but then the person didn't speak Spanish. And I was like, but you know what? This person's awesome. We'll still look for another bilingual person, but I want them focused on English accounts. Wow. So. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Right, right. It could happen. But yeah, so I think matching a job description and a resume, again, they don't always have to be perfect. There is some gray areas. Right. Um, and I think as a client, you need to be more realistic that, especially if you're in a, a smaller market or, or somewhere like Miami, where everyone says there's no talent here mm -hmm. because more companies are moving here because everyone wants an Android or an iOS developer. Maybe trying to find someone that's got the experience that's going to fit with your culture, but can learn other tools or skill sets, I think is probably best. Okay, cool. We got engaging with the staffing firm too early, right? Yeah. It's so, a big one. Well, it's a, it's a pet peeve of ours, I yeah. guess. I mean, someone comes to you and says, we have this need and it's urgent for us. It's business critical. But when you actually find them candidates, they sit on resumes for weeks on end, mm -hmm. right? So if you are going to use a staffing agency, make sure that you're ready to pull the trigger. Right. Because in a week, anything can happen, mm. right? In, in recruitment terms, a week is a long time. A candidate could have gone for a telephone interview, gone in for a face-to-face, sure. -face, been offered something, and he's already left. The right, and then you're the frustrated also because you've done all the work, you've served them a great candidate, it's ready yeah. to roll, bow's been tied, but. And then it comes back to, oh, we can't find talent. Sure. Right, yeah. because you've dragged your heels and then all of a sudden this guy's gone elsewhere. So I think if you're willing to engage a staffing agency, make sure that your process is internally tight, make sure that you can pay for the candidate and make sure that you can move quickly because if you take too long, those candidates are going to elsewhere. Right. Can't find so. talent is such a bullshit excuse. Again, like we said before, it goes back to unrealistic, unrealistic expectations, right? Yeah. You can find talent, but for whatever reason, you can't find the talent that you're locked into inside your head that are the the purple squirrels, as you say, right? The purple unicorns. squirrels yeah. that fart rainbows. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> right? It's just like... I can't find the mythical creature that I'm looking for. Well, no shit. You know, you have to. The, because they don't exist. Exactly. You have to they reset your exist. expectations. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, hiring for tech skills over culture. You want to. Yeah. So yeah. again, if you're a startup and you have a skills gap and yeah. you want to get someone in, typically what you're trying to do is, is find someone with that skill set. Yeah. Right. Whether it be an engineer, whether it be a business intelligence person, project manager, but if you take them on too soon or too quickly and you think this person's perfect, they've got the great technology skill set, but they're not a good culture fit for the mm. business, then they, you're going to find that out later down the line. So, right. Um, an example is I, I worked with a company in the UK and we had, uh, we had a contractor. He was a .NET developer, right? Mm. We had placed him about 10 times. Technically brilliant but was someone that you would put in front of a computer and would sit and talk to the computer, but wasn't very social. Sure. Then we had an Australian guy who had just arrived, who was 
very good technically, was probably, again, another 80 percenter, mm -hmm. was nowhere near as strong uh, technically as the other guy, but because he had a personality, because he was someone that was going to fit in with the culture, when they both interviewed, the client went with the Australian. Gotcha. So it was yeah. something that I learned very early on, that doesn't matter how strong someone is technically, as long as they're a good culture fit, they're for probably sure. going to go with someone that they can go for a beer with. For sure, right? 100%. Can I hang out with this guy? I'm spending a lot of time in the trenches with him. I'm going to be talking to him about technical stuff, but I'm also going to be talking to him about my life and everything right. else. So is it someone that I feel that I can like have some chemistry with? And you could teach skills. You can't teach culture and personality, no. right? That's just, if it's not a fit, it's not a fit. And some people love talking to computers. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I've had many instances when I was running the company where we hired better technical skills and we knew the person was an asshole and we just said, but he's a fucking rock star. Let's bring him on. He's great. Shit ton of money. Never worked out. Yeah, he was always it. out of the company uh, within a few months. Uh, conversely, when we hired, for example, we hired junior developers. Uh, it took us a while to get there uh, mentally, but as soon as we made the shift, it was incredible. Uh, we hired a few developers out of WinCode. Um, and Fantastic. They shout were, out to WinCode. Shout out to WinCode. <laughs> shout out to Joe and Yuha. <laughs> Love you guys. Um, so, I mean, we hired them right out of WinCode, fresh out of coding boot camp. And the reason we hired them was purely on cultural fit because they had a little bit of skills. They just came out of WinCode. They knew the, the basics and, yeah. and, and how to code. But these were go-getters. These were passionate people. These were positive human beings. They were yeah. joy to be around. They turned up on time. Eager learners. They outworked and outshipped within months they outworked and outshipped all the senior developers wow uh just based on work ethic and culture alone yeah. so you can teach that yep. it's just about like you said about personality and cultural fit over the skills you have to have more of a long-term view that if you're going to hire someone for two to three years which is on average kind of what the retention rate is yeah. um you know you you got to be comfortable with, okay, they don't know everything now, but they will in a few months or hopefully within a year and, and have that vision. It's funny you say that because we just found that there's actually a stat out there that says something about um, most permanent people will only stay in a full-time gig now for about three years on average, mm. which is crazy. crazy. I mean, obviously, when I look at resumes, I've got people that have been in roles yeah. for eight years, 10 years, 12 years. Yeah. But nowadays, because after three years, people get bored. They yeah. want to move on. They want to go and find a different skill set or work with different teams. Or and the world is much, much more accessible these days. You know, before it was like, what's in my 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 local city? What yeah. are the opportunities that I can be in, et cetera? And now, you can you know you find jobs anywhere. You can work remotely. Um, you can learn anything online these days. You know, you can self train yourself. So. Yeah, that just puts the onus more on the companies to to hire right, to hire smart, which is... And be flexible. Yes, exactly. There are some fantastic talent out there that want to work remotely. And if you're one of those companies that says they have to be here in yeah. the office, then you're going to miss out on that. It's, it sounds to me a lot like you're also a coach. A lot of the things that you do in your business is the coaching CEOs and, and people yeah. that are hiring, hiring managers on just how to approach things, right? It's not just finding candidates. Oh. It's not just like taking a resume and matching, you know, companies and candidates. It's really about shifting perspective and showing them what's realistic and showing them what the market is and teaching them all these different things. Right? It is. It's a huge. It's that's where we can we call ourselves consultants. Right. Right. Because that's what we're doing. Right. We're, we're not just coming in and saying, "Oh, we can help you find someone." There's so many other things that go along along with that. So. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Hiring solely based on a recommendation. Another big red flag of yours, huh? So, so how many times has someone said to you, I've got the perfect person for you? Oh, yeah, And then for you've sure. interviewed them and they've- You're going to love her. You're going to love him. Amazing. Rock star. Ninja. And, like, then, and then you like meet incredible. them and then what? Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. There was, there was, there was some, there, maybe because that person worked with them yeah. or they had some good experience with them. For sure. Or they're childhood they, friends with them. Yeah. You know, are they actually right for you? Happens all the right time. Culture? And that's right not, that's not a knock against people. They want to help their friends. And obviously they, you know, grew up with these people and they're like, you're going to love him. You're going to love her. But at the same time, you have to judge based on merit, you know, but you'll be surprised about the amount of companies that will take a recommendation. Mm -hmm. They'll, they'll speak to them, they'll make, maybe spend some time with them, but they won't do their full due diligence. Yeah. They won't do background checks, they won't do references. Yeah. They'll maybe spend a, a half an hour interviewing them and they'll go, oh, this was a recommendation, let's take them on. Right. And then find out two or three months down the line that they're not a good culture fit mm -hmm. or that they don't have a skill set that they needed because they didn't really spend time with them. For so sure. I think a lot of the time is if you do get a recommendation, make sure you still go through your same process, right? Put them in, in, in a, in a, um, in a, 
interview setting with five or six other candidates yeah. and see how they come up against other people that weren't a recommendation. Mm. So I think that's important to make sure that you also have people that you can put them up against, right? If it's just someone, oh, this is a recommendation, this candidate's fantastic, but I want to see some other people in the market, mm. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that makes total sense. This is really good stuff. So now I want to I wanna flip the tables and want to talk about the candidate side, okay. right? I think that's almost just as important, right? We talked all about the, the hiring uh, side of things, but now let's talk about the people that want to get hired. What are some of your top tips for those people? Let's start no. off with the obvious ones, right? Of course. Yeah. yeah. Make sure you dress for the interview. Okay. Right. And and a lot of the time, whether it is- That's not easy also though. Like we don't figure out how do I dress for this company, right? Yeah, but so, sometimes so better overcompensate. If it's, if it's through an agency, mm -hmm. they should be able to tell uh, you what it is. So they would say if it is more of a dress down, like these guys are a bit more business casual, or if they're more of a corporate environment and you have to wear a suit. If you don't know, make sure you go in a suit. Right, I think that's just the interview technique 101. Make yeah. sure you're dressed to impress. Right. Even if the people are dressed down, at least you, you've looked the part. And you showed that you cared about this interview. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you actually give a shit. For sure. Right? Uh, turn up on time. Mm -hmm. I know, again, it's another goes without saying, but the amount of people that will will plan to get somewhere and then they get caught in traffic mm -hmm. or they're running late. Like mm -hmm. That's never a good thing to start off an interview with, right? So I always say get there half an hour early, go and find out where the place is, grab a coffee mm -hmm. and make sure you're there and ready so you're not rushing, running right. around, walking in, sweating. Right. So I think, again, they go without saying they're obvious, but I think dress to impress and be there and be there on time are very key. That could change everything from your mindset. If you're like, it's one minute to go before you're supposed to be there and you're rushing through traffic and you're weaving and like you said, you're sweating and you haven't had time to just take a deep breath before the interview, it could change the whole dynamic of the, of course. the interview. Yeah. And then I think for the, for the best part, the most important part for any candidate interviewing is researching the company, okay? You'll be surprised at how many times a client says to me, I just got off the call with such and such and they didn't know anything about us. Mm. And again, it's our job as recruiters to make sure that we inform them to do that and we do our best. And when we send them details, we make sure that they do. But you'll be seasoned professionals that are CEOs, presidents, 250K a year salaries that they go on to an interview and they haven't even looked at the website of a company. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, that's crazy. I mean, obviously, if you're younger then. I guess I get it, but when you're when you're a seasoned professional, you should research the business. You should research the person you're speaking to. Mm. Is there anywhere they've worked? Is there anyone that they know that you may know? Do you have a connection with them? Yeah, they, like uh, the job interviewers love that. They love that you took the time to interview them. That they know, for example, what their favorite sports team is, yep. or that you, you, like you said, you went to the same college as somebody you know. I read a news article yeah. on you guys, and I right. heard that you're doing some fantastic stuff in the industry or whatever else. Like that kind of stuff just sure. goes down so well. Sure. Um, but yeah, you'll be surprised at the amount of people that go into an interview and they haven't researched it. And I think that's just the number one interview technique that I would say if you if you're new to the interview world right maybe you've just come out of college maybe you've been in a role for five or ten years and you, and it was a friend that got you the job mm -hmm. and you've never had to get your resume out and go and spend time going through an interview process things like this there are plenty of things online to look for it but make sure that you look at those interview tips one of the things that a client will say to you at the end of an interview process is do you have any questions for us and if you say no, yeah. it doesn't typically go down well. And that question always comes up. Always. always. Do you have any questions for us? Yeah. Right? And if you go, oh no, I think everything's been answered, like it definitely just leaves a little bit of a, a sour taste in the interviewer's mouth. So throughout the interview, make sure you have plenty of questions to ask, but always have one or two locked in the back of your mind that maybe haven't been answered. Right, so that you do when they do ask that question, you have something to ask them. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me a bit more about where the future of the company is going? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me the last time you did X, Y, Z? Ask something that is relevant to them and the industry that shows them that you have been doing your research, mm -hmm. right? But to have that in your locker, I think is massively important. Huge tip, huge tip. I, I, I know just kind of being on, on both sides of the table and then particularly when I would interview other people, I would say 90% of candidates say no. Do you have any questions for us? No, no, yeah, and that. And how do you feel when they? Yeah, say that it's to just you? like it's it's it ends on the bad note because that's the last question you ask, and it yeah. just ends on it kind of deflates the room a little bit, right? So yeah, so I think that definitely for me that's a, a massive tip. Make sure you have something locked in the back of your mind. Make sure you have plenty of questions to ask. And again, it comes down to that research. Yeah, right? is there something that you can throw out there at the end that's going to wow them with? Oh wow, this person's got that kind of knowledge about us, or they understand the industry, or something about a competitor. 
something that is just going to be completely left field that they don't even know that you're going to ask them uh, that probably didn't come up throughout the process. So I'll give some of our listeners some tips on great questions to ask. Number one, what keeps you up at night, right? You could to turn it back on the CEO or the, the interviewer. Love it. What keeps you up at night? What stresses you out? Because at the end of the day, you want to help them get more sleep. You want to make their job easier. So yep. what are the things that are keeping you up at night? What are the things that are stressing you out? Great question. Usually stimulates amazing conversation. The other one is what's the end game? What's like the ideal outcome? Let's say this all goes well in the next five years. Where is this company? Like you can ask them, where do they see this company in five years if everything is going well? Again, great conversation stimulator right there. Yeah, so I it. think those are two great examples of if you, if, if people don't know the right questions to ask, I think those are two good ones. Yeah, fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Um, I guess the next the next tip for me for candidates is is, is always be positive. Mm. So um, don't ever bad mouth for your sure. old clients or your past employees or past employers. Um, don't ever talk about kind of people that you work with in a in a bad way, because it just it, it causes a red flag straight away. Yeah. Um, but it also doesn't show you in a good light. Right. If you're going there and you're positive and you're showing the energy and you're talking about everything in a in a positive light, then it's definitely going to have a better um, outcome on the interview. Whereas if you start saying, "Oh, I worked with this person, I didn't enjoy that," or "My old boss was bad because of X, Y, Z," like mm -hmm. I think that is uh, that's something that a lot of candidates will do. And I, I'm surprised the amount of people that come into our office and badmouth their current employer. Ridiculous. Yeah, because people yeah. are hiring for a positive net gain in their company. They don't want added stress. They don't want you know. The, they don't want to visualize also this person talking shit about them in three or four years, right? They yeah. want to, they want to see that even, and by the way, this person is looking for a job because the previous job didn't work out for whatever reason, right? And it's a really important test if that person can frame that in a good light, if they can compartmentalize what happened as, as not finger pointing, because it could be on either side. There's two sides to every story, of course. but just frame it as a learning experience and it just wasn't a fit. Et cetera, et cetera. I think that shows a lot, right, to the interviewer. Yeah. Another one of your tips is uh, score success in the first few minutes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so again, I think that comes down to when you're spending time with with a client. Um, they most interviewers will make um, their decision within that first five minutes, mm -hmm. right? They say actually it takes like sixty seconds in order really? for you to meet someone for them to make a decision whether you're right or wrong. If you can talk to them about a common ground. Oh, I noticed that you used to work at. Microsoft, and do you know Will Weinrub, mm -hmm. right? Being able to have that kind of um, connection with them straight off the bat is going to help with the rest of the interview. Talking about, um, I read an article about what your, your current business is doing, and one of my friends works for one of your competitors, and just something that makes sense to them, so you're getting some sort of feedback from them and the buy-in, mm -hmm. right? I think that's massively key. Um, so yeah, so, so scoring that success in the first kind of minute or two yeah. could even be on your walk to the interview room, mm. right? Rather than sitting down and just going straight into an interview, you want to be able to talk to about, I, I worked with someone. I noticed on your LinkedIn profile that you're, you're, you're friends with, with Joe blogs. Yeah. Me and Joe went to school together Yeah, oh and that's just going to open up the dialogue. Yeah. Right. So I think that part of it is, is, is to be able to try and get that connection very early on in the interview would, would help. For sure. And there usually is that walk that they come in, they get you and, and you it's walk always in. an awkward walk. It as usually well. is. You it's have to, you, you should. Walk find some commonality to like you said a lot of people make their decisions within the first 60 seconds like Indeed. you know just ease into the interview nicely yeah maybe some of the homework that you talked about earlier that you showed them you did your research but like oh, i'm really excited to be here i was just you know looking up the company the other day and some really exciting you guys stuff. are doing some great things in the yeah. industry like yeah. I'm, I'm excited to be here. yeah it's fantastic i think a lot of people forget that the other person at the other side of the table usually it's the the candidate that feels that you know they're under pressure and here it's an interview and they're being scrutinized usually the other person on the other side of the table also feels a little bit you know uncomfortable and you know they don't love they have being the same in that pressure position. to make the right decision correct exactly they don't want to make the wrong hire right exactly. so they're still under that under the cosh as well so. exactly they want they yeah. want this to succeed just as much as you do of course right right yeah. great tip great tip next one's follow up with a thank you note massively important right the like there's a lot of people that don't do that no one does crazy like, no one that does. baffles me it's insane nobody closes the loop why wouldn't you do that right like surely that's just common sense yeah so again it goes without saying that if you're interviewing and that person spent time with you mm -hmm. whether it's a ceo of a company whether it's a manager whether it's a business owner just to send them a thank you email is, is just is so professional mm -hmm. to start with, but it shows that you're hungry. It shows that you can follow up. It also shows your work ethic, 
right? If you're working with a client and you don't do that, the chances are that client's probably not going to want to hang around, especially if it's in like a sales role or it's a role where you're having to do lots of documentation. Sending a follow-up email is just common sense and just a professional Absolutely. as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. So I think it needs to be, thank you for your time. Um, I'm very interested in the position. Spending time with you has, has piqued my interest in the company. Um, I would really want to know what the next steps are. Um, you mentioned to me that you're interviewing other people. Like, what are the time scales? When, are, when are we going to be hearing back from you? And it just shows that you're, there's interest there as well. For sure. And I think another great tip is it ties into your previous point again, where you know, make sure you have those questions at the end. You have any questions for us and you ask them like, what keeps you up at night or where do you see the company in five years? Yeah. You can then take that information and personalize the thank you note. Yeah, of course. Be like, you know, it really resonated with me when you shared what keeps you up at night. I can totally empathize with that. I hope that when we work together, we'll be able to alleviate some of that yeah. pressure. And another fantastic one is, is yeah. do you have any reservations about me? Mm. So if someone says, do you have any questions for us? And you've, all the questions you've gone are out of your mind. The, the interview, you pretty much, they pretty much answered everything. One of the questions to ask them is, do you have any reservations about me? Mm. And really get them to turn around and say, do you know what? No, I think you're a great fit. I think you've got the right skill set. Or maybe there is a reservation. And maybe that's a time for you in the interview to be able to overcome that. Ooh, and to I, have like that, that. I like that. I like that because that can never be addressed if we don't bring that up, yeah. right? Because also, if you leave and send them an email, it might be they go with another candidate and you've never had chance to address the reservation. Right, so. right. That's true. That also shows self-awareness and that you're yeah. okay with critical feedback, yeah. right? That There's a lot of good things with that question. I like that one a lot. Okay, awesome stuff, brother. So if someone wants to find you, Benjamin Douglas, where can they go? Um, so we are currently based out in South Miami. Mm -hmm. um, our website is uh, going live in a couple of weeks. So we've had a website for the last couple of years. Uh, didn't have a lot of traffic through it. So yep. we're having a brand new website that's going nice. to launch in the next couple of weeks. Nice. Um, I've just been out doing video productions with case studies and testimonials from a number of my clients. Um, at some point, maybe I might even come and video you. 100%. From our, from our hey, history. I'll look into this camera now and I'll give a testimonial. <laughs> Hire this guy. So, um, so yeah, so uh, BenjaminDouglas.com. Um, we're out in all of the chambers. We're networking all the time. Yeah, we're starting you're, to get you're, some, you're an some animal brand when it comes to that, man. I love that. And uh, yeah, we just uh, last year we were top 50 fastest growing companies in South Florida, which I'm massively proud about. Sick. So over a three year period, we grew 55%. Again, like I say, we're only seven people. So we're a small outfit, but we're working with some fantastic clients here in the, in the Miami area. And uh, yeah, if, if you have hiring needs, if you want any tips on, on writing your resume, if you, wanna help, if you want help with uh, interview techniques, um, we can help with all of that as well. And uh, yeah, if uh, anyone makes any introductions, then especially coming off of the back of this podcast, uh, I think I'll give Will a little kickback and make sure that he's looked after. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love that. Um, no, you know, just I, real quick, I've worked with Doug uh, a few times over the years and, and I could speak to, you know, the quality of work that you do. You're a high integrity, good human being. You you have all the right intentions and uh Bro, I'd work with you a million times over again. I so appreciate that. You get the highest recommendation from me. And now you're stuck with me because we're in forums together. That's it. For a, yeah, for a long time, <laughs> brother. A long time. All right. Thank you, Doug. Appreciate you being here, brother. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you too.